Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's just about afternoon time, right? I think we're still in the morning. But um, uh, my name is Mike Conley. I'm the uh, Chief Information Officer for the Cavaliers Operating Company and Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. I'm in my seventh season uh, with the organization. Um, joined the team more uh, to lead our digital efforts through digital transformation, eventually evolving into taking um, uh, responsibility over for IT disciplines within our organization. So. I'm going to preface this by saying this uh, presentation, based upon some of the others I've seen today, may be a little bit more technical, specifically around the architectural side, as to details on how we're achieving the real-time results that we're looking for. So if, it's, um, if there's a lot of flow charts and other things that pop up along the way and you have any questions about it, please do uh, try to track me down afterwards in the presentation. But I'd also like to thank Axis uh, for um, allowing us to present what the Cavaliers are doing, uh, leveraging their platform from a ticketing side. We've been an access partner uh, really since the uh, mobile revolution around ticketing took place. Uh, we've been doing it for greater than 10 years now. So if you can imagine the amount of uh, data we have in our environment uh, that we've captured around user behavior, uh, ticketing, um, and uh, the opportunity that relates to that, uh, we've, we've grown pretty mature in understanding the marketplace both on the primary and the secondary side. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about ticketing optimization. Uh, the real-time data is really more um, specifically about trying to focus on ways to uh, create more informed decision-making around events as they transpire. So uh, things that we'll cover in this, this presentation, uh, data architecture, I already talked about that. We're also going to talk about the applications that are being leveraged by the organization to be able to pipe in and do a lot of the real-time analysis that takes place. Um, use cases, we'll talk about real-time dashboarding. Everybody's seen real-time dashboarding, it's been done, uh, but it is in the delivery that you make that information available back to the organization that makes it valuable. Um, we live in a day and age where uh, we're trying to drive people to five, six different locations across a multitude of applications, and uh, it can really be cumbersome or overwhelming as a business user if you're uh, being held responsible to try to leverage all those applications. So centralization of that process is really important, and uh, we'll get into some of those details. Uh, whale watching. Anybody have an idea of what whale watching is? It's about trying to be informed when somebody enters into your venue, who they are, uh, when they uh, entered into the venue, and uh, where they're going to be sitting during a given time. Our member specialists, who are focused on providing white glove service to our uh, season ticket fans, um, are equipped with state-of-the-art information related to uh, the individuals that they have to manage and the accounts they need to manage. So we'll talk about how we're leveraging whale watching um, to enhance that experience specifically for our members. Uh, the Power Portal, uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, we just got done with a two-year transformation uh, in our venue, and it was a $185 million project that really focused on trying to reinvent and reimagine the fan experience for a building that's, that's 26 years old. So a lot of retrofitting and things that had to be done, but we focused a lot of our time and effort on the point of ingress and egress to create wow moments that would capture the fans' uh, you know, um, emotions and, and be able to deliver them a really unique experience when they come and go. So the Power Portal is a 2.6 millimeter DV LED tunnel that welcomes people into the venue as they come across with a state-of-the-art audio system. But the reason it's on here is some of the unique things we're doing with real-time data and the identity of individuals as they're coming into the venue to be able to reward them as they come through. And then lastly, forecasting and predictive modeling. Uh, this is a huge growth opportunity for all organizations across sports. How do you manage and maintain uh, your predictability against what's going to happen around a very volatile market? You know, if we can't control the product that's happening on the floor, how do we create a consistent baseline that we know we're never going to go below? We always have the ability to grow that baseline, but predictive modeling is, is allowing us to now start to save money in other areas of the business around staffing, um, you know, food ordering, and other things that makes us be a bit more accountable and responsible back to our business. So here's the architecture. All of this really sets off of the instance of the fan. So if we're going from left to right, the important part is focusing on the fan. Access is the fan identity. So when you're talking about the fan identity, they're coming into our venue with a mobile ticket, they're scanning via a mobile scanner, and the individual uh, fan that's coming into the venue gets a seat locator. The seat locator that's printed out is the only piece of collateral that that individual fan will have come in. The rest of it is all behind the scenes. It's all digital transfer of information and data. Um, we're fortunate. We do have a development operations team internally. We've got 10 full-time heads that are focused on just the development of applications for critical business use, also around the fan experience. 
eight back-end devs and two front-end devs are building applications and delivering them back to the business on a, uh, uh, an Agile framework. We, we operate in Agile Scrum, so every two weeks we're rolling out new iterations of the product line for the business. And more importantly, we've created a very continuous feedback loop of getting this into the hands of the power users. They're getting us good feedback so we can quickly iterate and make changes. If we tried to do waterfall, if we tried to do more of a traditional release against our software cycle, we would be killed. There's no way. Our business is too fast, too dynamic to try to compete in that way. Um, because we were a new development operations team, we're fortunate that we didn't have to take in 20 years worth of technical debt. And all that legacy debt of those systems and having to figure out ways to modernize your stack is a nightmare. So the benefit of what you're seeing here in the architecture, which is very AWS-centric, is all being built serverless. So by a show of hands, who, who in the room is using serverless in, in their day-to-day -day environments? In five years, everybody in this room is going to be raising their hand around serverless because of the changes and, and the power that it makes in being able to, to quickly be able to deploy and make infrastructure changes as you need to go. You can elasticize the way you're developing, which is very, very, very important. Um, so a pretty complex model. We're going to break down each of these individually and talk a little bit about how each of these are impacting the business. So here's a, a real-time data snapshot that we get directly back from Access. This is a scan payload. Uh, the delivery of this information that comes in is actually available to us to act on before the tickets are printed out of the actual gate, uh, gate printer. So if you think of the power of that, right, your time to live on the data that you're receiving in is going to make or break your ability to be able to make good informed judgments on it and be able to turn it into a valuable application that can turn value back to the business. So while it's very robust on the left side, there's a lot of information we can glean from that that has created these use cases. A lot of people will look at that data and say, well, it's a lot, that's great, but what am I going to do with it? You can see there's a multitude of opportunities you can do with it, whether you're looking at it directly from the development side or even being able to bring, bring information back to the business that becomes valuable for them to make better decisions. On the far right side is an example of how we're transforming some of those payloads to simplify the delivery of the data to real-time application layers that don't need the complexity of all those other nodes you see on the left side. It's simplifying it so we're delivering to it what we need to deliver to it. You'll also see on the right side there is a transform. If you look at the badge value, that badge value is very, very important. And what that is is a lookup that's happening in real time back to our database that sits in Redshift that allows us to put a label against the type of individual coming into the venue. So price code types tied to a ticket allows us to do a lookup. The price code tells us, yes, this person is a member. We pass back a badge value. That badge value then acts as the identifier that we map into the visual experience inside the Power Portal itself. So if I'm a member, I'm getting a heightened experience and a much better um, you know, notoriety in regards to my uh, relationship back to the team. So real-time applications. Um, there's a multitude of different application providers out there that, that will be able to visualize and provide you with BI dashboarding. What we found is they're not all optimized for real-time data. As a matter of fact, they're all really bad at it for the most part. So you have to find a platform that can take Firehose data and be able to plug it in and refresh uh, on a rate that is going to be accurate. The second you start losing faith and the belief within your own organization that the data you're delivering is becoming 5, 10, 15 minutes late, the buy-in, the belief, and all that change agent management that you're trying to do starts to go to the wayside. You have to find a critical platform that's going to allow you to do things very uniquely. Uh, whale watching, power portal, and predictive modeling, uh, we'll get into kind of how those are broken out as well. So event-based dashboarding. We've got uh, a total of nine different dashboards we deliver focus on real-time data. On the very top part is where it all began. It's us looking at all of our uh, entrances, and by uh, scanner location, which is grouped together with an entrance name, we're able to actually tell the story of who's coming into the venue and when and at what time by, by entrances. So the immediate value on this and the reason why we went down this path was to give our facility operations team an understanding for how they were staffing our entrances. Why would you put 15 scanners in front of the entrances when the, when the doors open at 5.30 when the bulk of your traffic is coming through at 7 o'clock closer to game time? You now have the ability to modify and save costs around staffing and how you're bringing people into the building. This also gives you an understanding for the different entrances and the behaviors of your fans who are coming inside the venue. We just transformed our building. Our, one of our biggest goals was to try to get everybody coming into the building to explore all the new places that we've created. And anybody that's looked in the analytics tied to, to behavior inside venues, people are very predictable. They come in through the same entrance, they go through the same VOM, they go to their seats. Getting to, to go outside their comfort zone sometimes is a challenge. 
Uh, below that, you're seeing a little snapshot on retail sales. So we have real-time uh, uh, retail sales, real-time food and beverage sales coming in, and real-time ticketing information that's coming in. We're also watching all of our email sends in real-time and putting correlations against spikes in retail sales that we're seeing. Now, the question is always funny. Well, well how is this impacting the business? You know, what's the ROI? I believe in ROI, don't get me wrong, but there's also a value in return on operations. Your return on operations is giving your team members the confidence to go out and know what they're selling and having the intelligence to be smart about what the, the product they're selling on a day-to-day -day basis is just as important. We've seen a lot of great real-time decision making that have changed approaches to when we release campaigns, uh, when we release offers based upon the data that's coming through from all these different channels, which is very, very important. Uh, whale watching. This is, uh, this is another, uh, this kind of started, once you look at real-time dashboarding, you're saying, okay, what can we do to really make this actionable? And what we've done, we, right now we're on Microsoft Dynamics as our CRM platform, and uh, our development operations team just built this little, you know, iframe that we can plug in that allows all of our member specialists to subscribe. And all they're doing is subscribing to a member or a whale. And what this does is the second they come into any event that they're actually scheduled for and they scan in, we immediately send out a text notification directly to the device of the member specialist that subscribed that tells them this person entered into this building at this time with these tickets and these seats. Um, we also have the ability for people internally to be able to ping back off that same session, that text session, and get information about where are they now. Have they crossed the threshold into the Wine and Gold United Club? Have they gone into different areas of the concourse? with the goal of being able to provide them the best possible service that we can, given their uh, commitment to be member specialists and provide the best possible service. Um, we have two different options here. You can either receive an email or you can receive a text message. And I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room, email, and 22-year-olds don't even know how to use email. And I, I say that politely, and I say that very, very politely. Most of them are going in to activate their Android devices or other devices. Most of them are staying on chat platforms, text platforms, messenger platforms, social platforms. We originally thought we were going to see more email distributions. The texts have outweighed the emails by far in every deployment we've done. Now, on, uh, on average, on game days, we send out 695 text messages directly to our member specialists for people coming into the building. Um, to comparison, we've got about 3 to 4% that are actually emails that go out uh, with that uh, around the same amount of time. The nice part, once you've subscribed here, any event that we have in our ecosystem, you're also getting notifications about when that member is coming into the building. So, Power Portal. So this, this is kind of, how, how do you make it fun? How do, you, how do you take it away from what data is to make it really, really fun? So what you're going to see here is two different, uh, different layers. You've got your data layer which is how we're extracting the data out of that experience. You saw on the payload on the left side and the right side that I showed you on that earlier slide, and then you have the application layer. The application layer, and when you look at digital signage, a lot of people think this high-end rendering, it's powerful rendering, you gotta put all these render engines behind it. This is all built leveraging uh, JavaScript, HTML5, and CSS3 on a portal that renders in 8K. You have the ability to build web applications to really uh, create some unique interactions between data and the physical experience that you're seeing in there. So I've got a video I want to show you that kind of uh, highlights the first time we, we debuted it. And just look at some of the reactions to people going inside the venue and the process that unfolded. So got a little, uh, we got a little legacy jittering there, but um, hopefully you were able to see from the point when somebody was scanning a ticket to the point where they walk into the portal, there's about a 20 second delay from where somebody enters to where they enter into the portal. So the idea of having to time out the location and for when somebody scans in was really critical for us. So next layer of what we're adding into that, and I don't know how many folks have, have seen the AWS DeepLens cameras that they just released recently, which is a machine learning camera, that can tie back into a database that looks at specific recognition that can identify individuals that will act as a sensor and a trigger to allow that, that uh, firework to go off in the tunnel to make sure we're rewarding that person in the moment they're actually in the space itself. 
We're capturing most, I'd say about 70% of the fans coming into that entrance, but you can't, you can't control user behavior. If I'm gonna go up, I'm not always gonna go through the portal. I may go to the left of the flex wall or some of the other areas in the atrium. So our next goal is how do we hone that in and really focus on ways to improve that and make that better. Uh, the last part I, I wanna talk about before we um, you know, open it up for some questions here is predictive modeling. So a lot of folks were, were, are trying to get into this space and trying to find reliable models that um, you can start to use to really make well-found decisions around, uh, around our events. Here's the architecture for how we're approaching that, and we're doing that across the board with those three, uh, three main payloads. Right? You got your ticketing data, your, uh, your food and beverage data, and then you also have uh, your retail information coming in. How do you start to build models that will let you know what to expect from a revenue perspective? So again, all the decisions you have to make downstream of that start to really become much more clear, and the goal eventually is to get to a decision automation system where we can start to kick a lot of this stuff off through automation, where right now we're using human manual uh, efforts to try to get a lot of this stuff done. So the example that you see down on the right, um, one of the main uh, areas that we're focusing on now is just trying to get show rate correct. Everybody's got a drop count, right? And we know all of the business that goes into defining what a drop count is. There's a little bit of left pocket, right? There's all creative uh, ways that you can make a drop count and look the way it needs to look. Then there's a the reality of the people that are actually showing up inside your venue. That's what I care about. I need to understand what's happening and what, we, what we're going to be up against for a given day. Now, we run these models. We have a baseline, a mid, and a ceiling model that we run, and then we put a blended average against it as we're starting to try to tweak the results. Our goal is to try to get within 3% accuracy. But what we're finding is the model within two days in it starts to get a little volatile because of the changing of the markets and, and, and some of the other real-time events that could play into it. Cleveland, weather is a big factor when you look at uh, events around this time of the year. February is always a volatile time getting people in, in and out of the venue. Well, we had a game the other night where we thought we were right in with our model, and we had been feeling really good about ourselves, riding high for about nine, to, uh, nine or ten games, being perfect with 3% accuracy, until we hit the snowstorm that came in, and we were like, oh, well, here we go. This is going to completely throw off the model, and it did. But what we found is when we went back in afterwards, it wasn't as much the effort around the weather that threw it off. It was the ability for us to add in additional variables without impacting the weighted values we've already put in place. So it's, it's a matter of just really fine tuning. And I know a lot of people have read the Google flu, you know, story about this great flu modeling that took place before. And, and, and their downfall was they never tuned the model afterwards. So they got the CDC and everybody else really, really excited about it. But then the accuracy of it, the accuracy of it started to tail and tail and tail year after year, which lost public confidence. This is no different. Predictive modeling is a constant process of tuning, tweaking, adding attributes, and figuring out what weighted values are going to be most important to make the best decisions. And in this case, our modeling two days out is where it's the most accurate. So our next frontier is how do we figure out ways to infuse real-time information around weather? How do we look at traffic patterns? How do we look at the RTA schedule, which is our regional transit authority, and start to put the appropriate values that can give us that finite amount of accuracy we're looking to close the gap on between those two days leading into an event? But with this, what I'll say is this process has really allowed us to start to democratize data and information across the organization which is the biggest thing as a group we can do. Our job is not to change and dictate to them, it's to help influence and bring this adoption that allows everybody else in the business to feel empowered that they're contributing back to the end goal. Having this stuff available and omnipresent across multiple channels was a big driver for us to be able to start to change that culture. We're not perfect, we're not there yet, but we're seeing the adoption curve start to pick up, and we're almost crossing the chasm of adoption right now where it's becoming part of the day-to-day -day culture and the way we live. So some of the main takeaways, and I think this is really important. Uh, everybody is at a different point in time for their digital transformation. We're all going through it, and we all have to go through it. The business that we're all facing is gonna be dramatically different in five years. If you don't agree with that, simply look at your fan behavior. If you have the ability to track your fan behavior and understand the way it's changing, I've seen a lot of slides here throughout the course of today that have talked about the primary and the, the, the life of the primary through like 1950 and the change fans and all this stuff. We are rapidly changing right now and loyalty and responsibility on the team side is to figure out ways to get out ahead of that curve because right now we're trailing. And if we're not understanding the way our businesses are operating in real time, there's no way that we can start to rely on a record of truth data that's 24 hours old because it's gonna be too late. 
We need to have this omnipresence awareness of what's happening at any given time. So what I can tell you is use it to drive innovation and inform decision making. Um, allow your teams to make failures. Fail fast, but give them the portfolio to quickly get out and start to explore, stand stuff up, bring stuff down. So the, the quick ones that happen are just as, uh, it, it, it are happening just as quickly as the quick failures. And it's about, it's about figuring out ways to have that influence into the right group to get the buy-in that's going to really make a difference organizationally. Uh, democratize the availability of data so all team members are empowered to be innovators. How do you get into their hands? The one thing uh, I was hoping to show today, and if anybody's interested, I can kind of show this in the back end, this goes back to the texting process. We know that we can't send everybody to five, six, seven different applications. So what we're doing is we're building a data layer and then putting Lexbot technology on top of that to allow on-demand querying against information so they receive it back instantly the second they need it. So text, drop count. I text drop count on my device now, all guarded and secure based upon our one login layer that we have for all of our team members. I know what's distributed, I know the scan rate, and I also know how many people are in my building. If I want food and beverage sales, I can text FB sales. I get that information back immediately. If I want to know um, if this individual that's in the building is a member, it gives me that information back. I have their account number. I have their email address. I have details about the tier they're with. I also know their discount percentage that they're supposed to be getting at the retail team shop. It's informing and empowering people to always feel like when the customer is looking at them, that they truly understand and care about who they are when, the, when, when they're in our building, which has is, which is really made a big difference. It's actually helped us reach 91% of our uh, renewal uh, goal for this upcoming year. Uh, in a pretty challenging year on the court, 91% renewal to goal is pretty darn good when you're talking about retention and season ticket holders. Um, you can also think of ways that data can be used for critical business functions in improving the fan experience. It doesn't just have to be reported. How are you going to make data come to life inside, inside the venue, especially valuable data that people are providing to you, um, and you really have to cherish and, and, and take you know, good care of that. That's the new goal. But how are you making the most out of what they're giving to you in return? Um, and don't be afraid to be uncomfortable. Challenge yourself and the team to think of new ways to leverage data. And then just remember omnipres uh, omnipresent data aids in adopting a data-first mindset across the, uh, the organization. Uh, again, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without our partnership with Axis. Axis has been able to provide us um, these Kinesis streams and shards, which gives us that real-time payload uh, with a very low time to live, which is incredible. When you look across the landscape, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, organizations or teams are looking for the application as a holy grail, the data, and the, your ability to transform that is where it starts. So thanks for your time and allow me to present to you. Any questions at all? Hi, um, I'm curious to know when a customer walks in and their ticket is scanned, um, that JSON chunk, is that sent directly to your dashboard and refreshed automatically? Is there some kind of transformation that goes along in the yeah. middle? Yeah, the JSON, the JSON chunk that's there is a transform process that happens downstream only to be able to get it to the application layer for what we're building inside the Power Portal. So the JavaScript is, is really the, the, the base level for how we're building that web page, and then we're leveraging HTML5 and CSS3 to bring those clusters into visualization for the portal. So what you saw on the portal is actually four different layers of graphics and data that comes across. So once somebody scans in, and I know the video didn't do it justice. It'll render a firework with their name on it, but then after a period of time, it dissolves and goes back into a, um, uh, think of it as like a guest book for everybody that's scanned into to that, uh, that entrance for a given day, and we scroll that from left to right across the portal in perpetuity. So the moments that are happening upon scan then get saved to kind of create an archive for where people are there. The JavaScript is also a key part of that, so we can maintain a feed of that information without it getting way too heavy down the end to process all of those calls back at a different time. So there's, um, you know, it, it's, think of it as kind of like the fourth step downstream for where we're going to uh, pipe back in the application layer. Does, does that help I answer your question? Gotcha. No, no. Yeah, no problem. I had a question about privacy. So do customers have the opportunity to opt in or opt out of this portal scenario? I just, I can think of yes. some instances would alienate some customers. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, so from a, 
From the perspective of location services, so security, at the forefront of all this is what's most important. And right now, everybody has heard about security and security being important, so thanks for raising that question. Key thing is, is when somebody walks into a venue, there's a terms of use and engagement that that fan agrees to when they're coming inside your venue. It's printed on your tickets, it's in your privacy policy, it's outlined in a variety of different places. And what that states is, if you provide information um, coming into the venue as part of your point of ingress, that anything captured by the organization during that time could be repurposed as part of the fan experience inside the venue. But in order for us to take and visualize the names, the person has had to opt in for location services, also has to be tied into the Wi-Fi at some point for us to be able to get an email address back to them to be able to match, match their name. Now the payload we're getting from Access gives us that detail immediately. We cross-reference that against the process so we make sure somebody has opted in before we go and visualize that name on the actual portal itself. But anything that we do, our, our Wi-Fi as a whole, right? The Wi-Fi, the second you log on to public Wi-Fi and you're opting in, it is giving the ability to leverage location services and um, being able to, to really better understand what your experience is gonna be inside the venue to deliver you the right service that you're looking for. So how are you using um, some of this data to inform the actions that your sales representatives and some of the broader organizations can take? So um, for instance, you talk about the predictive analytics and the drop rate. Is that then informing your staffing decisions for the game in two days? Um, how is your organization kind of adapting to this new wave of information that can kind of help drive revenue? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because without that, what, what's the pur purpose of it all? We've, we found the first area of interest in staffing, in, in facility operation staffing, where before they were in the blue and the gray a lot about how they should be staffing in different areas. They kept growing every year and it seemed like they were putting more people to be able to provide a better fan experience. And what we were trying to say is that's not making sense. Let us work with you to be able to create a model where we can show you the volume of people that are coming in based upon the way you're staffing and slice that by 15, 20 minute increments so you'll know at any point in time how many people are inside the venue, which was really half the goal. Um, so when that, when that information became available, then you have to become a change agent in delivering that information. And I can't state how critical that, pro that part of the process is. If you go to somebody and dictate that says, hey, this data right here is saying that you guys are overstaffed because we don't have enough people in the building, they're going to turn their back on you right away and walk, and walk away. It's about influencing them by introducing the data that shows the opportunity that's in front of them and working with them to help transform the process they've been working through over the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years that really becomes the biggest difference. You're a partner in the process. You're not the whistleblower in the process. Um, you're, you're helping them go through and transform and really make a difference. So what started there then really opened up the door for curiosity for other areas of the business to start to come to the group to help them solve some of the business problems they have. And a lot of this stuff is a result of that process of listening. And you know, I, I encourage my team, uh, my development team, to shadow um, critical parts of the business on event days just so they can see how that individual is going through uh, you know, the process of an event to say, okay, what we're doing isn't aligning with the, actually the way that they're working inside the field. So that human aspect still has to be there. And the technology is, is only gonna be there to help, help move them along and help speed up their, their, their process for change. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you for your time. Thanks, thanks for letting us tell the story.